Claudius Day by Thomas Mann, retold in English and illustrated by Jeff Gable. Munich was shining. It was a beautiful sunny first day of June. A blue sky was stretched across the festive squares and the white colonnades, the antique style monuments and Baroque churches, the fountains, palaces, and the big residence gardens, and the wide streets lined with green. Things were running leisure in the beautiful city. People practicing pianos and shit, young people whistling the Notung theme, they're the same ones that are sitting in the cheap seats in the theaters in the evenings. They walk in and out of the universities and the library with literary magazines in their jacket pockets. A royal coach stops in front of the Fine Arts Academy. Young artists with round hats, loose ties and no canes, carefree tradesmen that pay their rent with drawings, and check out them pretty dumpy little girls with their dark hair done up in hair bands and their feet that's a little too big and their accommodating morals. Some fancy architecture between the bourgeois houses, here and there some vacants and nymphs decorating some doorway, all rosy and naked. You'll never go bored hanging out in front of the displays of the woodworker shops and the modern luxury stores. Everywhere there's small shops for sculpture, frames, and antiques, where the busts of the spicy Florentine Quattrocento women look out at you. And even the owner of the smallest and cheapest one of them stores, they can talk shit about Donatello and Mino di Fisoli like they personally gave him the rights of reproduction themselves or something. Well, if you're lucky, you'll meet one of these women in person that you're used to seeing through art, one of them rich and hot chicks made out of imitation Titian blonde, all done up with jewels, where some genius painter makes her hotness so it lasts till eternity. So art's in bloom, it's in control, and it spreads its rose twine scepter across the city and it smiles. Everyone respects it, everyone takes part, everyone helps it thrive. Beauty rules and Munich's fucking awesome. So there's some young fucker walking up the middle of Schelling Street toward the Ludwig Church's wide facade. If you'd seen him, you'd thought a shadow covered up the sun, or you'd feel like the memory of a difficult hour came over your soul. Didn't this dillweed love the sun that bathed the beautiful city in festive brilliance? Why is he crawled back inside himself and looking down at the ground while he walks? He wasn't wearing a hat, though no one really would have noticed that, because of the slacker dress coat in this carefree city. But instead, he had the hood of his big-ass black coat pulled up over his head, and it laid shadows over his low, protruding, angular forehead, covered his ears, and made a frame around his faded, worn-out cheeks. What kind of grief was on his conscience that could have hollowed out them cheeks so bad? Ain't it a pisser to see pain and sorrow sitting in the hollows of some guy's cheeks on such a sunny day? His eyes had the look of knowledge, narrowness, and suffering. When you saw him from the side, his face looked just like some old portrait done by a fucking monk that's stored in Florence somewhere in a small marble cloister, from where a heavy-handed protest came smashing down against life and its triumphs a long time ago. So Hieronymus keeps walking up Schelling Street, and he's walking slow and steady while he holds his big coat together with both hands from the inside. Two of them young, cute, dumpy chicks with hair bands, the big feet, and the accommodating morals. They was walking arm in arm, and they walked by him, and they nudged themselves and bend over forward laughing their asses off at his hood and his face. And they laugh so much it makes them run forward. But he didn't pay any attention. No, he kept his head down and didn't look to his right or his left. He just crossed Ludwig Street and climbed up the steps to the church. The big gates in the middle was wide open. Somewhere in the consecrate dimness, cool and dank and all messed up with holy smoke, you could see a weak, reddish glowing thing in the distance. Some old woman with bloodshot eyes was pulling her ass up from a prayer bench and hauled herself between the columns through the church on crutches. Otherwise, it was completely empty in there. Hieronymus goes to the holy water bowl and sprinkles his forehead and chest. Then he bends a knee in front of the big alder, and then he stands in the middle of the aisle. Well, don't it seem like he grew bigger here inside? So he's standing there, straightened up without moving none, 
lifting his head up all free and shit. His big crooked nose seemed like it was sticking out in front of his strong lips with an authoritative expression. And his eyes wasn't looking at the ground no more. Now they seem brave and look straight in the distance over at the crucifix on the big altar. So he stands there a while without moving, right? Then he bends his knee again while he's stepping back, and then he leaves the church. So he's walking up the Ludwig Street, slow and steady with his head down, in the middle of the wide street, heading towards the big logia with the statues. When he gets to Odeon's plots, he looks up so his forehead gets all wrinkled up across it and slows down his steps because he notices the crowd gathering in front of the displays at the big swanky art gallery that's owned by Mr. B. Man, it was a fucking glorious set of displays. Reproductions of masterpieces from all galleries of the world in fancy expensive frames. Pictures of modern paintings, like if antiquity was reborn in a comical and realistic way. The sculpture of the Renaissance casted perfectly. Naked bronze bodies and fragile decorated glass. Bold vases in iridescent coatings. Fancy books with works by fashionable lyricists that was decorated in elegant splendor. It was more shit than I could even explain to you here. So the people are going from one window to the other, showing each other the displayed treasures, trading opinions back and forth, looking over each other's shoulder. So Hieronymus goes into the crowd and starts looking at all this shit too, doing his own personalized inspection, piece by piece. So then he comes to the one window where this one wild-looking picture was that everybody's gawking at. And for a while, he looks over the shoulders of the people that got their asses crowded up in front of him. And then finally, he makes his way up front, right up close to the display. The big reddish-brown picture stood there all tasteful in antique gold on an easel in the middle of the display booth. It was a Madonna, done all modern. Man, it didn't have no conventions from a Madonna that you ever seen. The figure of the Holy Mother was a hot-looking woman and partway naked. Her big sultry eyes had dark outlines and her delicate lips with a strange smile while they was halfway open. Her thin fingers was a little nervous and convulsive looking the way they was grouped up and they was grasped onto the kid's hip. He was a naked kid, his shape was distinguished and slim, almost like it was primitive. And he was playing with the woman's jugs while he gave this wise-ass glance from the side right at you while you're looking at the picture. These two other young guys was standing by Hieronymus and talking shit about the picture. They were carrying books under their arms that they probably got from the city library, so they was educated and they could talk bullshit about art and science. Man, I wish I was that kid. Fuck too, goes one of them. Yeah, and it looks like he's trying to make you jealous, goes the other. Damn, she's fine. Man, I'd like to ram her. It kind of fucks up your whole idea of the immaculate reception. Fucking A2 right. She kind of gets you where it counts. Have you seen the original? Yeah, no shit, I seen it. Man, if you think she looks hot now, you should see the original, especially the eyes. But the similarity is spot on. What do you mean? Oh man, don't you know the model? He used his young house cleaning chick. It's pretty much a portrait, only he done up the corrupting part quite a bit for this picture. The young girl in real life is a lot more innocent. I would hope so. Life would be too hard where you got a bunch of these Madara Madara women running around. The Pinacotech bought it. Really? See, them fuckers knew what they was doing. That way he did the skin and the flowing lines of the robe, that kicks ass. Yeah, that sucker can paint. Do you know him? A little bit. He's going to get famous, that's for sure. He already got invited to the Regents for dinner twice. As they said this last part, they were already starting to go their different ways. Then one of them goes, Are you going to the theater tonight? This one theater company does the best version of Mandragola by Machiavelli. No shit, that'd be cool. I was going to go to the artist Varieté, but I think I'd rather see the fearless Niccolò instead. When they said goodbye, they separated, and they stepped back and went away in different directions, and other people made their way to where they were standing and looked at the picture. But Hieronymus just stood there without moving, 
He had his head stuck forward, and you could see how his hands balled up like a spaz while they was holding the coat closed by the chest from the inside. His brows wasn't raised up anymore with that distant and kind of ugly and a little malicious and surprised expression. No, now they'd lowered themselves down and got darkened. And his cheeks, they was halfway covered up by the dark hood. Well, they seemed even hollowed out deeper than before. And his thick lips was all pale. His head slowly bent lower and lower, so finally it got to where his eyes was way down and looking up from underneath and fixed hard right on the artwork. So that fucker stands there like this for at least a quarter hour. The people around him, they broke up by now, but he didn't move. Finally, he turns around real slow on his heels and leaves. But the picture of the Madonna, well, it went with him. It didn't matter whether he was dicking around in his small crappy room or kneeling in the church. It was right there in front of his indignant soul, with sultry and lined eyes and the mysteriously smiling lips, all naked and hot and wasn't no prayer that could scare it away. So, in the third night, some command shouts down on Hieronymus from on high, telling him to get in there and do some bitchin' about the light-hearted profanity and the smart mouth way of jerking off on beauty. And it was just like for Moses in that one Bible story. It wasn't no use trying to get out of it by opening up his mouth and sounding like he's dumb or something. No, because God's will laid it out straight to him. He needs to sacrifice his candy ass in front of the laughing enemies. So he leaves in the morning, because that's what God wants, and he goes to Mr. B's big swanky art gallery. He's got the hood up over his head again, and he's holding the coat closed from the inside with both hands while he walks. It had got humid, the sky was pale, and a storm was brewing. A lot of people was jammed up in front of the art dealer's windows again, especially the one with the picture of the naked baby playing with the Madonna's jugs. Hieronymus only took a quick look over there, then he pushes the handle of the glass door that's all done up with flyers and art magazines. God wants this, he goes while he's stepping into the store. This one young chick that was writing in a big book at some desk, she was the cute brunette kind that I said about earlier, with the hairbands and the big feet. She comes up to him and asks all friendly. She asks, how can she help him? Listen up, goes Hieronymus, quiet, with the wrinkles across his angular forehead and looks all serious right in her eyes. You ain't the one I'm here to talk to. It's the gallery owner, Mr. B. She kind of hesitates a little as she moves back from this crazy fucker and gets back to her business. He just stands there in the middle of the store. Everything that you could see on display from the outside, well, it was piled up in here like 20 times more and spread out lavishly. Hieronymus looked slowly to both sides, and then he pulled his black coat together even tighter around himself. There was some other people in the store, too. On a wide table that stretched across the whole room, there was this fucker in a yellow suit with a black goatee looking at a portfolio with French drawings, and sometimes he would laugh at them where he sounded like a goat. He was getting served by some young guy that looks like he gets paid shit and eats shit too. He was carrying the portfolios out for him to look at. Across from the goatee guy, there was this swanky old woman looking at modern embroidery, big fancy flowers in pale shades that stood straight up next to each other on long stiff stems. Some other fucker that works there, he was helping her out. Then there was this guy from England sitting at another table, all casual and shit. He was dressed durably and shaved clean and cold, and you couldn't hardly tell his age, while he was trying to pick out a bronze piece that Mr. B was bringing him personally. The bronze was this one graceful figure of a young naked girl that wasn't ripe yet, with tender limbs of coquette purity. Well, the English guy held it by the head and studied it hard while he kept turning it around slow. So, Mr. B, he keeps moving around the English guy, saying every word he could come up with to tell him how great this girl sculpture was. 150 marks, he says in English. Munich art. It's sweet, ain't it? Beautiful. Just look at her. Alluring. Charming. It is gracefulness itself. Divine and worthy of the highest admiration. 
Then he thinks of one more thing and goes, most exquisite and appealing. Sometimes he bend over close to the buyer, like he's smelling the guy for how much he's worth. When Hieronymus came in, he gave him a quick one of these sniff examinations too, but turned back to the English guy right away. The fancy woman, she'd made her choice and leaves the store. Then some other guy comes in. Mr. B gives him a quick sniff too, to figure out how much he could buy. Then he lets the young bookkeeper chick wait on him. Well, all he ends up getting is a fiancé bust of Piero, the son of the famous Medici, and then he leaves again. The English guy's getting ready to go, too. He decided to get the sculpture of the young chick, and he leaves while Mr. B's all bowing and kissing his ass and shit. Then the dealer turns around at Hieronymus and goes over in front of him. What's up, he asks, not very humble. Hieronymus holds his coat closed from the inside, with both hands, and looks in Mr. B's face, without even blinking an eye. Then he opens up his big mouth and goes, I'm here because of that there picture in the window over there. The big picture with the naked chick and the naked kid. His voice was reserved and didn't change up and down none while he talked. Oh yeah, goes Mr. B, all lively, and he starts rubbing his hands. Seventy marks with a frame on it, guy. It's a perfect reproduction. It's most attractive and alluring. Hieronymus don't say anything right away. He bowed down his head in the hood and sunk into himself a little while the art dealer was talking. Then he straightens up again and says, I'll tell you up front that I can't afford none of this crap, and even if I could, I wouldn't want it anyway. Sorry if that's a bite in your balls, but in the first place, I'm poor. And then I also couldn't give a rat sorry ass about what you're selling. Ah, uh, fuck, says Mr. B. Well, might I ask? And Hieronymus starts again where he left off. If I ain't mistaken, you hate me because I can't afford nothing. So Mr. B goes, Uh, well, no, it's just that... So Hieronymus interrupts him. Anyway, I'm asking you to take a good hard listen to what I'm going to say. Mr. B goes, might I ask... You might ask, goes Hieronymus, and I'm going to answer. I'm here to tell you to take that picture of the naked Madonna chick out of your window right now and don't ever show it again. Mr. B looked in Hieronymus's face kind of like a numbnuts for a while, like he's trying to get him to be embarrassed by his own psycho words. But since it didn't work at all, so then he says, Who died and made you the fucking president? Where'd you get the right to come in here and... So then Hieronymus interrupts him again. Shit, too, ain't no authority or rank from the government that sent me here. It's my conscience is why I'm here. Mr. B was moving his head back and forth, looking for what to say, and had a hard time getting words out. Finally, he goes, Your conscience? Now listen up and take notes. Your conscience? It don't mean jack shit to us. Then he turns around and goes all quick to his desk toward the back of the store and starts writing stuff. Them assistants was laughing their asses off, and also that hot little chick over there was snickering over her account book. That guy in yellow with the black goatee? Well, you could tell he must have been from another country, because he didn't understand a damn thing what was going on. He just kept on looking at them French drawings, and now and then you'd hear him do that laugh like a goat. Take care of this crazy ass, says Mr. B over his shoulder to the assistant. Then he goes back to writing. So that one young assistant that looks like he gets paid crap, well, he goes over to Hieronymus, trying not to laugh. And the mother sales guys come up close, too. Is there some other way we can help you? Says the assistant guy softly, the one that gets paid crap. Hieronymus just keeps looking right at him with his painful, blunt, yet penetrating stare. No, he says, I don't want nothing else. I'm asking you to take that Madonna picture out of the window and don't never put it back. Why the hell should we do that? It's a holy fucking mother of God, says Hieronymus, in a hushed voice. No fucking shit, but you heard the man. Mr. B's not listening. You gotta take it into account that it's the holy mother of God, says Hieronymus, and now his head's shaking. Yeah, so what? Ain't a guy allowed to display no Madonnas? Can't nobody paint one if they want? That ain't what I mean, goes Hieronymus, almost like he's whispering. 
while he straightens himself up high and shakes his head hard over and over. His angular forehead under the hood, now it was full of long and deep wrinkle lines. You know damn straight that it's pure blasphemy there, what that fucker painted. It's naked lust. I heard it with my own two ears outside. These two genius half-wit types that was looking at the Madonna picture, they said it fucks up their idea of the immaculate reception. Well, I can explain. That ain't what the picture's about. That's what the sales guy says with a shit-eating grin. See, he wrote this brochure about modern art in his free time, so talking up some fancy intellectual crap, well, that was pretty easy for him. So he says, that picture's a work of art, and you gotta learn to measure it with the right stick. Everybody loves it. Shit, too, even the government bought it. I already know the government bought it, goes Hieronymus. I also know the painter got invited to eat with the regent. People everywhere is talking about it, and God knows that means they're going to kiss his ass like he's Mr. Art Star or something. But what does that show you? It just shows you that the world's full of a bunch of jerk-offs that could only happen when everything's full of shameless hypocrisy. This picture's made for getting people's rocks off. Ain't that right? Answer me, and you too, Mr. B, you turdhead. Answer me. Then there was a pause. Hieronymus seemed like he really was waiting for an answer for real, and his painful and penetrating eyes looked back and forth between the sales assistants that looked at him like he's a crazy ass and Mr. B that had his back to him. It was still quiet, except that guy with the black goatee that was bent over them French drawings. He kept laughing them goat sounds. It's true, continues Hieronymus, and you could hear some serious anger shaking in his reserved voice now. You ain't even trying to deny it. So then how can you be serious treating this painter like some kind of king, like he's made mankind one step better with this picture? How can you just sit there and don't look at it critical and let that picture make people get all hot and bothered and then you silence your conscience with the word beauty or you talk yourself into it that the whole thing's a noble and dignified deal? Is this profane ignorance or corrupt hypocrisy? I gotta admit I'm stumped on this one. This is fucked up where a guy can get famous like a damn rock star because of his dumb, overconfident, animalistic drive. Beauty. What is beauty? What makes beauty these days, and what does beauty make? It ain't possible that you don't know this, Mr. B. But how can it be that you can see so clear right through this kind of thing and you don't feel like a sorry ass for it? It's a crime to take these shameless, clueless, unhesitating, smart-ass fuckers and make them think they're cool for worshiping beauty and make them famous, because they're a long way from suffering, and even farther from salvation. You're an evil bastard. Answer me, you fucking nobody. Knowledge is the deepest plague of the world, but it's also the purgatory, and without its purifying pain, ain't nobody's soul going to be saved. You don't get holy from acting like a smart-ass dickweed with profane impartiality, Mr. B. No, it comes from that knowledge where the passion of our disgusting flesh dies off and disappears, it was silence. Then the guy in the yellow suit with the black goatee, he does a quick laugh. Get the fuck out of here, says the guy that gets paid crap. Well, Hieronymus didn't seem to have no plans to leave. He's standing there in the middle of the gallery, all straightened up in his hooded coat with burning eyes. He was talking a little rusty, but he had the gloves off and he was hitting hard. Art, you say, pleasure, beauty. Well, why don't you just wrap up the fucking world in beauty and give everything in the world the satisfaction of calling it style? What, people think they can candy coat the misery of the world with fancy colors? They think they can drown out the groanings of the agonized world with the festive sounds of lavish taste? You got it bass backwards. God don't put up with being mocked, and it's an atrocity in his eyes to see you arrogant fuckers worshiping glittering superficiality like it's some kind of idol or something. You're sending art down the crapper. Answer me, you fucking nobody. You're lying, man, I'm telling you. You're ridiculing art. Art ain't no unscrupulous deceit that tempts you to endorse the life of the flesh. No, it's the holy torch that mercifully lights into all the fearsome, shameful depths of existence. Art is the heavenly fire that's laid on earth so it can bust up in flames and melt away in redemptive mercy with all its scandal and martyrdom. Mr. B, take that picture by the famous rock star artist out of your window. 
Yeah, you could also stand to burn that piece of shit in a hot fire and scatter its ashes in all the winds. In all four winds. Then his ugly voice breaks up. He did a heavy step backwards and pulls one of his arms out from under cover of the black coat and stretches it out all passionate and points at the display with a strange writhing jerky motion. Yeah, he points at that display window there where that crazy-ass Madonna picture is sitting. So he stands still there in this commanding pose. His big bent nose seems to jump out with a domineering expression, and his dark brows that thicken up at the root of his nose, well, they was raised up so high that this time his whole fucking angular forehead was sitting in the shadow of the hood, and it was lined with them long wrinkles, and the hollows of his cheeks was all flamed up like crazy. This is where Mr. B turns around at him. Maybe it's because the suggestion of burning the 70 mark reproduction got him by the nads, or maybe it's just plain and simple that Hieronymus's speech finally worn out his patience. Whatever the fuck the reason, he looks like a pissed off sucker that's flight off the handle by now, and you couldn't hardly blame him for it either. He points at the door with his pen and was looking for words to say. Then he spits it right out. When you don't make like a dick in head right now, I'll have our art handler make sure you don't have no trouble finding where the door is. Understand, son? Shit, too. You see me shaking? You can't drive me off and you won't silence me, yells Hieronymus, while he pulls his hood together tight with his fist and shakes his head like he ain't scared of nothing. I know that I'm alone and powerless, but still I ain't gonna shut up till you listen to me, Mr. B. Take that picture out of your window and burn the fucker and do it today. While you're at it, burn all them statues, too, before everybody crashes down in sin. And burn them vases and fancy ornaments, them shameless rebirths of paganism, and them swanky decorated smut stories. Burn everything in your jerk-off store, Mr. B, because it's crap in God's eyes. Burn, burn, burn it, he yells, all excited, while he turns around in a wide circle, looking like a crazy fucker. It's all ready for the chopping block. The arrogance of the times is busting up all the dams. But I'm telling you. Then Mr. B yells at some door in the back of the room. He yells, Krauthuber, like he's about to blow a nut or something. He goes, Krauthuber, get in here now. Then what you seen coming into the showroom was like the Incredible Hulk or something. A big monster bursting at the seams, big enough to scare the holy crap out of anyone. His bulging and swelling padded limbs was all jumbled up in one big mass. Bigger than life, he was walking slow across the floor and puffing, like some giant corn-fed country fucker. He was a walking ball of energy. He was covered up in this giant apron smeared with glue, and the yellow sleeves of his shirt was rolled back from his big barrel arms. Krauthuber, can you open the door for this asswipe, says Mr. B. And if he still can't find it, then help him out onto the street. So the guy makes this sound like, huh? While he looks back and forth between Hieronymus and his irritated employer. It was a dull sound that was like he was trying hard to hold back his anger or something. Then he goes to the door and opens it, while his steps is shaking everything around him. Well, Hieronymus' shit turned white. He wanted to say, burn them, but he already feels himself getting turned around by a scary, overpowering force, and he was getting pushed slow towards the door from a power that you couldn't even think about fighting against. I know I'm nothing but a wuss, he says. I can't handle this kind of force. I can't resist it. No, but what's that got to do with it? Burn them. Then he shuts up, because it turns out he's not in the gallery anymore. Mr. B's giant hired hand had finally thrown his ass out with a little bump and a shove, and he went down sidewards on the stone steps. He's sitting there, leaning on one hand. Then the glass door closes behind him with a clank. So he pulls himself up, he stands up straight, and he's breathing hard, and he pulled his hood together tight up above the chest with a fist, while the other arm is hanging down under the coat. His hollow cheeks was all gray and pale and shit. His lips was twisted in the expression of despair and hate, and now his eyes was moving around with fervor, and they rambled around, all fucked up and ecstatic, across the beautiful square. He didn't see the people looking at him, all curious and laughing and shit. He looked at the mosaic in front of the giant logia, and on it he seen the vanity of the world, the masked costumes of the art festivals, 
the ornaments, vases, the jewelry and fancy stylistic stuff, the naked statues of women, the painted rebirth of paganism, the portraits of the famous hot women done up as masterpieces, the fancy decorated smut stories and propaganda writings about art. Yeah, he's seen all this piled up and going up in crackling flames under the celebrating chants of the people led by his frightful words. And against the yellowish bank of clouds that was raising themselves up from the Teatiner Street with a little bit of thunder in them, he's seen a big sword of fire sitting up there that stretched itself out in a sulfur light up above the joyful city. Gladius de Super Terram, he whispers, and straightening himself up in his hooded coat, he shook his fist that was hanging down hidden under his coat, and he quivers while he mumbles, Cito et Velocitaire. The End <laughs>